Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Leslie Kernison. I'm a board certified geriatrician and the founder of BetterHealthWhileAging.net. In this video, I'm gonna explain something that I wish all older adults and their families knew more about, which is what doctors should check if an older person develops memory loss or thinking problems. Because yes, if you have noticed memory loss or thinking problems in an older person, that is not normal. It absolutely should be medically evaluated. And in fact, the initial evaluation can be done in a primary care office. You just need to know what to ask for. Now you may be wondering, do these memory changes warrant going to the doctor, especially if it feels like it's going to be a hassle to get the older person there? And I get that people wonder that because there are two really common myths about memory problems and aging that are pervasive, not only among the general public, but even among doctors. The first is that memory loss or thinking problems are normal aging. It's normal to develop a poor short-term memory as you get older or to have difficulty. This is not true. That is a myth. The other myth that you shouldn't fall for is that there is nothing to do because memory loss can't be cured or reversed. Some people might even think that there's nothing to do because they've heard that memory loss might be Alzheimer's or another form of dementia and that that's not curable. But that also is false. Both of those are really myths that you shouldn't fall for. The problem, however, is that even many practicing doctors believe these myths. And so even when an older person comes to the doctor reporting memory loss or thinking problems, or actually what's more common is that their families convince them to come in and bring up the memory loss and thinking problems to the doctor, it's really common that people are told by the doctor that, oh, it's normal aging, or what do you expect? You're getting older. Or maybe that, okay, that's not normal, but there's nothing to do. This really bothers me because it's wrong. Memory loss and thinking problems do indeed become common as people get older, but they should never be considered normal. They are the sign of a health problem affecting the brain. And although it's true that some people are experiencing symptoms of a non-curable brain disorder, such as Alzheimer's disease, or another form of dementia, there are many other health problems that can affect brain function and some can be treated. Even people who actually do have Alzheimer's may have an additional medical problem that is keeping them from thinking as well as they otherwise could. And it's really important to identify those and treat them so we can help older adults think their best and live their best lives. So in the rest of this video, I'm going to do two things. First, I'm gonna take you through what I would say are the 10 most common causes of memory loss and thinking problems in older adults, so that you will have a better understanding of what might be causing an aging brain to malfunction. And then I'm gonna take you through 10 things doctors should do to evaluate an older adult experiencing cognitive symptoms as part of that initial evaluation, which can happen in a primary care office. That way, once you get to the doctor, you'll know what to expect and what to ask about. Now, I'm gonna cover this in the video, but if you would like to review this information in more detail or maybe review it written out afterwards, I'm gonna post a link in the description below to a full article I've written on my website, betterhealthwhileaging.net, where you can get lots of uh, information in detail and also links to related articles we have on the site. And so now we're gonna go into these 10 causes, but before I tell you about them, I want to emphasize something that's really important to keep in mind when it comes to memory loss and thinking problems and to the healthcare of older adults in general. What you wanna realize is that when an older person's memory or thinking aren't working quite right, and we call that cognitive impairment, in most cases, it's going to be multifactorial. So usually there's not just one cause that's causing all the problems. Most older people are actually experiencing several things that are keeping their brain from working at its best. So as we go through these 10 common causes, keep in mind that often we're not looking for the one smoking gun, we're looking to see which of these might be the cause or otherwise making things worse. Let me now take you through the 10 causes that I think about when an older person has started experiencing memory loss or thinking problems. In no particular order, um, I generally start with medication side effects. So it turns out that many commonly used medications interfere with brain function. So especially if you're concerned about memory loss 
or brain function, it's really important to identify these medications. And if an older person is taking them, try to stop them or reduce them. And many of these medications that affect brain function are available over the counter. Probably the most common one that I see older people taking that's available over the counter is something like Benadryl or something related. So a sedating antihistamine. These are often the PM components in a PM painkiller that you'll find over the counter, like in NyQuil or Tylenol PM. They're also available in over-the-counter sleep aids. So these medications are what we call anticholinergic. They interfere with transmission of um, neurotransmitters in the brain, and you need that to think at your best. Other medications that also slow down brain function include other sedatives and sleeping medications, tranquilizers, or medications that people sometimes take for anxiety or for their nerves. And then there are many other medications that are anticholinergic, such as medications for overactive bladder and a few other types of medications. So identifying these is important if we want to help an older person with their memory loss and sometimes can make memory loss or thinking much worse. So the next cause that I want to talk about is what we call in medicine metabolic imbalances. So uh, I wasn't sure how to come up with the non-medical term for this, but it basically means abnormal levels of some component of the blood chemistry, often an electrolyte in the blood chemistry. The ones that we most often see out of whack in older adults are blood sodium, blood calcium, or blood glucose. So if any of these are too high or too low, it can cause confusion in older people or slow down their brain function and cause them to have symptoms. Another cause of metabolic imbalances in older people, and in people who are younger for that matter, would be uh, kidney dysfunction or liver dysfunction. That's in part because the kidneys and liver often play a role in regulating your blood chemistry. But also, in of themselves, if they're not working quite right, the body can accumulate certain things in the bloodstream that can keep the brain from working at its best. How do we check to see if an older person might be experiencing one of these problems? Normally, that's done through blood work, um, often quite routine blood work. The third cause that I think about is problems with hormones. And especially in older adults, in geriatrics, we think about could the person be experiencing a low level of thyroid hormone? That's probably the most common cause of memory loss or thinking problems uh, related to hormones that we see in uh, older adults. Now, it's also possible to have brain function affected by imbalances in estrogen or other sex hormones. This is something that I would say affects uh, people probably more in midlife, so we don't see it as much in geriatrics practice, where we're often taking care of people who are in their 80s and 90s. Um, but that would be something to consider for uh, a middle-aged person and, you know, could potentially be an issue in an older person. The fourth cause that I think about is vitamin deficiencies. And especially, I think about vitamin B12 deficiency because it is fairly common in older people and vitamin B12 is very important to brain function. Depending on the person's situation, we might also consider whether they're experiencing low levels of other B vitamins or folate. Now, of course, the body needs many other vitamins to function optimally, and it's possible that those could affect the brain as well, but we don't usually routinely test for them. In particular, there's been a lot of interest in vitamin D these past several years, but even though it's been studied, often giving people extra vitamin D doesn't seem to help um, improve uh, cognitive symptoms. So, I don't particularly check for vitamin D if I'm concerned about memory loss or thinking problems in an older person. Now for number five. Number five on my list is delirium. This is a biggie because it's very common in older adults, especially if they have recently been hospitalized or undergone surgery or a major illness. So what is delirium? Delirium is basically a state of worse than usual mental function that is brought on when the body experiences a significant stressor. So sometimes it's referred to as hospital dementia or ICU psychosis. And that's because the stresses of hospitalization or when people are sick enough to be hospitalized or have surgery, those are the situations in which you can generate a big enough stress on the body for people to experience delirium. Now, as people become older and frailer, they can actually develop delirium even if they're not that sick. 
And so we do sometimes see it in the clinic. But what's important to know is that delirium can cause someone who's usually normal to behave like someone who's psychotic or very confused or has Alzheimer's or another form of dementia. Also, although delirium symptoms often get better as people recover from their hospitalization or surgery, it's important to know that it can take weeks or longer for it to fully resolve in an older person, and sometimes people never get back to quite the way they were before. So, if I hear about memory loss or confusion in an older person, I always want to know if they've recently had a hospitalization or surgery or another major illness so that I can think about whether delirium might be contributing to the situation. Now for number six. Number six on my list is psychiatric illnesses. So most major psychiatric conditions can cause problems with memory, thinking, or concentration. So especially depression. Depression can affect memory and concentration. And some older people even develop something that's called psychotic depression, where they can become frankly delusional or really seem very abnormal due to depression. Anxiety is another condition that is not uncommon in older adults. Generally, we wouldn't expect that to cause frank delusions, but it could cause difficulties in concentration or sometimes memory, especially if the anxiety is affecting an older person's ability to sleep and they're not well rested. It's also possible that some older adults have uh, another form of serious mental illness, such as bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, but in many cases, they have already been diagnosed with that earlier in life. So in general, if an older person has been experiencing memory loss or thinking problems, I always wanna ask about symptoms of depression or anxiety and ask about their mental health history to see if a mental health issue might be contributing to the symptoms we're concerned about. Number seven on my list is substance abuse and or withdrawal. So by substances, I mean things like alcohol, drugs, or even prescription medications, such as sedatives or painkillers. These definitely affect the brain, and the brain can definitely be impaired and not able to function well if people are intoxicated and currently under the influence. Or their brains can also be affected by chronic overuse, basically chronic damage due to the substance. And that's something we see especially with people who are chronic alcoholics. But also, if a person is used to using alcohol every day or their prescription medication every day and they're not able to use it, they can experience withdrawal. And withdrawal in of itself can cause confusion, thinking problems, and brain dysfunction. So, when I'm considering what might be causing memory loss or thinking problems, I always want to know, does this older person use any substances regularly, or is there a possibility they could be withdrawing from something? Next, number eight. Number eight on my list is damage to brain cells due to injury. And the most common form of injury that I think about is what we call vascular damage. So vascular refers to the blood vessels of the brain. And just as you have blood vessels throughout the body and a network of blood vessels for the heart, we also have a network of blood vessels for the brain. And the brain very much needs the oxygen that comes in through the blood vessels. So if there has been damage to those blood vessels, that damages brain cells and that can cause memory loss and thinking problems. If it's been a major blood vessel that was damaged, that would be a major stroke. And often people have obvious symptoms at the time they are having that stroke. But it's also possible for the teeny tiny blood vessels in the brain to experience damage for various reasons, often for reasons that are very similar to the reason why people develop heart disease. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, sometimes diabetes, lots of inflammation, lots of stress, smoking. And so when the small blood vessels in the brain are affected in this way and get damaged, the brain cells around them can be damaged. And this is sometimes called cerebral small vessel disease. And if enough of the brain is damaged in this way, it can cause memory loss and thinking problems. So that's one form of damage to the brain cells um, that is due to injury that I think about. The other would be head injuries, which can cause temporary or long-term brain function impairment. So when I'm considering whether this is an issue, I consider the age of the person, their past medical history, and we might consider a scan of the brain to see if we see signs of damage in that way too. I also ask if there have been any head injuries. 
Next, number nine on my list would be damage to brain cells due to neurodegenerative disease. Now, this is number nine, but it is quite, quite common for people as they get older, if they are lucky to get old enough to start experiencing some neurodegenerative diseases. So what are these conditions? These are conditions that basically accumulate usually in the brain and slowly damage and kill neurons over time, usually over years. So these are diseases that take 10, 20 years often um, to have to show symptoms and then for the symptoms to progress. You've heard of the most common neurodegenerative diseases. They are things like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. There are also other ones like Lewy body disease and frontotemporal degeneration. These conditions are um, often the underlying cause of um, conditions such as mild cognitive impairment, which means a person is having some memory or thinking problems, but they are not bad enough to interfere with day-to-day -day function. Uh, and then there's dementia, which is an umbrella syndrome describing a condition where people's brains have changed to the point that uh, it's a permanent change and um, they have lost independence in some daily life tasks and it's not due to a psychiatric condition or something reversible. And Alzheimer's disease is the most common underlying cause of dementia. So that would be another potential cause of memory loss and thinking problems in an older person. And then number 10 on my list is infections. So this I would say is uh, less common, but does happen. So basically certain acute, which means they're happening right now, or chronic, which means they've been going on for um, weeks or months, certain acute or chronic infections can affect brain cells directly. And the cause might be viruses, bacteria, parasites, a fungus. Um, so we don't routinely in geriatrics evaluate people for these kinds of uh, brain infections unless they're showing other symptoms or unless they've suddenly become uh, quite ill. And honestly, when memory loss or thinking problems come on very suddenly, we usually have a, another way of thinking about things than if it's been going on for months or years and slowly getting worse, um, which is the situation I mostly have in mind right now. now you may have heard of people developing memory loss or thinking problems because they're sick from an infection like a pneumonia or a urinary tract infection. This does happen, but in that case, we think of it more as an example of delirium um, rather than a direct infection to the brain because that's usually what's going on. So those are the 10 causes that I think about the most when I'm considering memory loss or thinking problems in an older adult. Now, I do want to acknowledge one more cause. It's not something we think about it's not something we evaluate a lot in geriatrics, but it has been brought to my attention, and I think it's you know, reasonable to have it on the list, which would be toxins. So by toxins, I mean things like heavy metals, air pollutants, water contaminants, pesticides. These are another potential cause of problems with brain function in aging. Um, but in geriatrics, and I would say kind of mainstream medicine, <laughs> um, and I personally aim to practice the best of geriatrics and the best of mainstream medicine for older adults. Um, we don't routinely check for these toxins. There's a lot of interesting research going on. Uh, it's also not clear right now how you would remove them or, or treat them. Uh, so it's not part of my routine evaluation, but um, you may hear other people mention it, and that is why. So those were my top causes of memory and thinking problems in older adults. And as you saw, there are many medical conditions that can affect brain function. So if you notice problems with memory or thinking in an older parent or another older loved one, or even yourself, it's really important to get a medical evaluation so that these can be checked for. So now let me take you through what I believe doctors should check when an older person is brought in for memory or thinking problems. These recommendations are based on my practice and the practice of most geriatricians and are basically in line with what the expert guidelines recommend for evaluation of cognitive impairment in an older person. Because basically what we want to do is check for those common causes that we just talked about to help rule them in or out. So here's my list. First, what the doctor should do is ask about and document the older person's concerns about their memory and thinking. Now, this can be tricky in that um, many older people are either unaware that they're having memory loss or thinking problems, or they are denying it, 
or they're defensive and get upset when it's brought up. So it often requires the doctor to be tactful about uh, asking about it. There are tactful ways uh, to ask, but it's very important to understand for the older person, what's their awareness of the problem and how do they see it? What are they most interested in or concerned about? It's also important to compare their perception of the problem with the perception that is uh, reported by other people, other family members, and with what the doctor observes. So that's definitely an important element. The next element that's important is for the health provider to get or request information about any signs of memory loss or thinking problems from other people, other family members like the spouse or someone else who lives with the older person or other what we call informants, <laughs> which are basically people who've had a chance to see the older person in their usual circumstances and might be able to provide information. Now, I have found that often doctors don't get around to doing this. It might be because the older person came to the appointment alone or didn't want anybody with them and they're not sure how to go about doing it. But it's really important for them to try to get this information because an older person who is experiencing memory loss or thinking problems is not a reliable reporter of what um, is going on with them. So it's really important to get that information. Also, you should know that it is not a HIPAA violation for doctors to try to get this information, and it's not a HIPAA violation for them to receive this information from you as family. So if you take a look at my related article on better health while aging, I'll have a link to my article on HIPAA and family, because many people in the public don't understand HIPAA, and actually many health providers uh, don't have the details quite right on what HIPAA allows them to do and doesn't allow them to do. But basically, you can always tell a doctor what you have observed because you as a family member are not a covered entity required to observe HIPAA rules. The covered entities are basically healthcare professionals, insurance companies, those of us whose work is healthcare. And then a doctor should not be disclosing all of the older person's health information to other people without their permission, but they certainly are allowed to ask as part of an evaluation if other people have noticed anything or have anything to share or contribute. That is not a HIPAA violation. So this is an important thing, and if, it's, um, if you are concerned about somebody who has memory loss or thinking problems, I wanna let you know that you are allowed to relay what you've observed to the health provider. You just wanna think about doing so diplomatically and um, ideally, the older person you're concerned about would be um, agreeable to, <laughs> to you doing so. Okay, so number three on my list is that the doctors should ask about any difficulties managing daily life tasks. So in geriatrics, we call this assessing function. So how is the person functioning in their daily life? And the two big buckets that we consider are activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. So really briefly, activities of daily living are the basic skills that we often learn in early childhood. Walking, talking, getting dressed, feeding yourself, getting to and from the bathroom, bathing. And instrumental activities of daily living are the higher level skills that we learn as teenagers that are usually required to live independently as an adult. So that includes things like driving or managing transportation, finances, grocery shopping, meal preparation, home maintenance, um, managing medications. As you can imagine, if a person is having difficulty with memory or thinking, it is often the instrumental activities of daily living that are affected first. And so health providers should really ask. They can both ask the older person have you been having any trouble with any of your usual activities or are you getting any help from anyone with anything? And of course, they should ask a family member or an informant because again, the older person may not be a reliable reporter of what they need help with. Understanding how the person's daily life is affected is matters both in terms of um, making a diagnosis or edging towards one diagnosis or another if it's a question of mild cognitive impairment versus dementia, but also it signals what the older person might need help with and support with or where there might be safety issues. So I think it's very important. Number four on my list would be that the health provider should check for other signs of behavioral mood or thinking symptoms. So this is often related to um, 
Are there signs of uh, mental health issues? Or are there certain behaviors or signs that might point us towards one type of cause of cognitive impairment or another? So specifically, they should try to find out, either from the older person or from family, if um, the older person has been experiencing things like hallucinations, delusions, personality changes, apathy, depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, getting lost, visual spatial problems. Um, if you would like a longer list of um, signs and behaviors that are often associated with memory loss and thinking problems, uh, I'm going to be recording soon a related video, 21 signs to look out for. Um, and I have a longer list right there that you can go through. So next on my list, number five, the health provider should ask about any new symptoms or changes to physical health. Again, we're kind of trying to piece it together with could these memory loss or thinking problems reflect another problem with the body somewhere else. Um, it's especially useful to ask about neurological symptoms, such as new problems with walking, new problems with balance, new problems speaking, or new problems with coordination. Number six, the health provider should try to find out if there are any concerns about substance use and consider the possibility of abuse or withdrawal. So again, this means inquiring with the older person about their use of alcohol, drugs, prescription medications, and also probably checking with family or others. Number seven on my list, very important, um, I would say, is to review all medications and focus on those that affect brain function. So especially the sedatives and tranquilizers and those anticholinergics, those over-the-counter antihistamines or sedating medications that interfere with brain function, and also looking out for the other anti, um, anticholinergics that are often prescribed for overactive bladder or for other causes. Again, I have a list of seven types of commonly used anticholinergics, which is uh, one of the links in the article related to this video, if you want to know more about those. And lest you think this is not important, um, I can think of many patients where when we identify those medications that affect memory and we reduce them, the person's memory and thinking really did get better. So I think it's uh, something very important and totally doable in primary care. Number eight is that the health provider should perform a physical examination and um, what exactly they, they examine is going to depend you know, on the details they found out so far, but generally you want to include a basic neurological evaluation, especially of the nerves related to the face and head and neck, because those are, um, all nerves are related to brain function, but those <laughs> have particular importance in evaluating memory loss and thinking problems. And um, the provider should also ask the older person to stand up and watch how they walk, have them walk across the room, turn around, and, and see. It's also a good idea to check for what we call Parkinsonism symptoms. So they're associated with Parkinson's disease, but can also be associated with related conditions such as Lewy body dementia. And for that, it's checking for a tremor. And in Parkinson's, the tremor is at rest. Not when people are moving, trying to do something, but when they're at rest, when their hands are in their lap, um, for instance. So it's looking for a tremor there, and then checking to see if they feel stiff in the arms or, or other limbs. Other things that would be looked for on the physical exam are, again, going to depend on the person's past medical history and what else has turned up you know, in the investigation. Number nine uh, for the evaluation is to specifically do some office-based testing of the person's memory and thinking skills. So I would call this uh, assessing their orientation and then doing a short office-based cognitive test. So in medicine, orientation means does the person know the date, the day, the month, the year, where they are, and who they are? Um, and I look at notes, and often the providers have not specifically assessed this. You really have to ask the older person. <laughs> you know, I often say, I'm going to ask you a few basic questions. They might seem a little silly. And then there's doing a few, uh, one of, uh, not a few, generally you just need to do one, uh, but um, there are a number of short office-based tests that can be done to test memory and thinking. So probably the shortest one that's well validated is called the mini-cog. So that involves um, asking them to remember three items. You tell them three items and later you ask them again and having them draw a clock and place the hand at a certain uh, spot. 
Uh, so that doesn't take a lot of time. And then there are other tests that can be done with pen and paper. They usually take 10 to 15 to 20 minutes. Um, the truth is they take longer when people are having memory loss and thinking problems. If you give them to somebody who's young and fine, they, they go quite quickly. But those would be tests like the, the MOCA, Montreal Cognitive Assessment, the SLUMS, St. Louis University Mental State Exam, or even the Minty, uh, excuse me, the Mini Mental State uh, Exam. That's an older test which is now considered a little less good. So we don't use it very often in geriatrics, but some providers are still uh, using it. And then number 10 on my list of what should be done would be that the health provider should order laboratory testing and consider brain imaging. Um, so I think it's a good idea to get blood tests unless they've been done very recently. And uh, so what specifically is ordered is going to depend, again, on the specifics of the situation, but generally um, checking a complete metabolic panel which would include blood electrolytes, liver function, kidney function, checking vitamin B12 levels, checking thyroid tests. Um, and then potentially there could be additional tests like a complete blood cell count if there's concern for an infection or another type uh, of illness that would be relevant to that test. It's also fairly common for people to order a brain CAT scan or brain MRI. MRI is better for showing the details of the brain when it comes to memory loss and thinking problems, but it does require sitting in the scanner for a good 45 minutes, which can be hard for some older people who are having memory loss or thinking problems. Um, on the scan, it can, um, it can show a variety of things. What it will often show are signs of some uh, small blood vessel damage to the brain. That is extremely common in older people. Most older people have it actually if you scan their brains and it has imperfect correlation with actual symptoms. So one of the things that I often tell people is that you can't really definitively rule in or out any cause of memory and loss of memory loss and thinking problems with the brain scan alone. You know, it's a piece of the puzzle, but it shouldn't be it shouldn't be the only thing done and then these other things are not done. That's really not adequate. So those are the 10 things. So really, if, if you put it together, we kind of need four things to happen during this medical evaluation. One is we need the health providers to document the patient and family's concerns. It should be in the chart that some concerns about memory and thinking problems have been brought up and what they specifically are, right? So, you know, either what the patient has noticed themselves that they're concerned about or what the family has noticed um, in terms of memory loss symptoms or thinking problems. Next, they really should document any difficulties that the older person is having in their daily life tasks. Um, again, because if the person is having a lot of difficulty, we need to think about how can we provide more uh, support um, or assistance. It might also make it more urgent to get other family members involved. Third, during these evaluations, we want the health providers to do their own objective assessment of the patient's memory and thinking abilities. Even if it's something quite brief, like just finding out if they know where they are, the day and date, who they are, and whether they can do some you know, fairly basic things like remember a few words and draw the clock. And then lastly, the health provider should really do that initial evaluation for common medical causes and contributors to worse brain function. So especially the medication review, possibly the basic labs, and checking for a few of those other medical causes that I mentioned. Is this gonna lead to a definitive diagnosis? Not necessarily, but it's an important starting point and it shouldn't be delayed. So again, if you're wondering how do you get this evaluation, I wanna tell you that you do not have to wait for months to get seen at a special memory center for this. This, all, this initial evaluation can be done in primary care and I would say should be started in primary care. Now it's extremely hard to do it in just one visit <laughs> unless the clinic is really prepared for these kinds of evaluations. It is often going to take at least two visits, but it is doable in primary care. In short, if you've gotten concerned about an older person's memory or thinking, I hope you won't believe those two myths that, you know, it might be normal aging or that there's nothing to do. Now you know what are the potential causes and now you know what should be done as part of a medical evaluation. So I hope this will help you um, 
or your loved one get the evaluation that they need. If you want more details, be sure to check out my related article. You can even print it out and use it as a resource. And if you did find this video helpful, please subscribe since I plan to continue to make videos related to memory loss and other age-related health challenges. So thank you so much. Uh, take care, thank you for watching, and I'll see you hopefully in another video.